themselves on the map of human geography. It tells them where they are, but more importantly, what they must be. Now, that is my favorite quote from Dr. John Henry Clark. And now, I'd like to share with you, from the beginning, a couple of excerpts from this remarkable award-winning documentary by Sinclair Bourne, narrated by Wesley Snipes. Remember, it's a film. It's a documentary film. You, of course, are only going to be hearing on the radio. Uh, the, you, but this film, documentary film, is yours as a thank you gift. With your pledge at the $100 level, you can use your Visa, American Express, or MasterCard. You can honor your pledge with a personal check, money order. We'll work with you uh, to come up with the most convenient way of honoring the pledge. And uh, the, all you need to do is to call the number. And uh, in about three minutes or so, the transaction will be over. The number is 516-620-3602. That's 516-620-3602. Remember, the, the, uh, the book, uh, Brainwashed, Challenging the Myth of Black Inferiority and Companion Interview with author Tom Burrell, that continues to be available as a thank you gift as well at the $100 level. But now we're going to sweeten the pot even further by adding uh, ad, uh, an additional thank you gift also at the $100 level. So this is an alternative thank you gift at the $100 level. This is uh, uh, John Henry Clark, A Great and Mighty walk. When you call that number, 516-620-3602, you can just tell them that you want either the John Henry Clark or you want a great and mighty walk. Either way, but it's, it's the same thing. A great and mighty walk with uh, John Henry Clark. The number again, 516-620-3602. Documentary film by Sinclair Bourne, narrated by Wesley Snipes, available as a thank you gift on DVD. We hope that you get it. In fact, we'd like you to join those on the line right now. In, in, please call 516-620. That's 516-620-3602. And we thank you very much for your support. <laughs> How do you describe a legend, an African-American hero, an historian, an activist, who for half a century has charted a singular course dedicated to the intellectual and spiritual liberation of a people? Though his eyes are now darkened by glaucoma, he continues to enlighten the lives of thousands of men and women through the pages of his many books and in university classrooms across the country. How do you describe a legend? You can't, really. But you can meet the men and women who influenced him. You can learn from him the hidden history of the African people. Learn from him a different way of making sense of this complex and often very confusing world. And you can let Dr. John Henry Clark tell his own extraordinary story in his own soulful style. Alabama, New Year's Day, 1915. That was a great feast day in our family. And because my mother was a favorite in the family, and I was late arriving, she said that nothing would be killed in this family until my child is born. And I didn't arrive until three, and everybody was hungry. The feast had not started, and I wasn't exactly welcome. <laughs> they never quite forgave me for that. 
holding up the feast. My early schooling was in a one-room schoolhouse that we called Miller's Hill School. When we moved slightly out of the city, I was chosen to go to city school. Officially, I never finished high school in the formal sense until later years. In fact, I taught two generations before I took time out to get my BA, my master's, and my PhD. And I have it all now, but uh, I'm principally self-trained. My university was the public library and well-chosen second-hand bookstores. So while I grew up poor, I grew up in a very rich environment, culturally rich. I grew up with a whole lot of love and affection, a lot of lap time, a lot of slap time, too, because I wasn't permitted to get away with too much. Miss Evelina Taylor is my fifth grade teacher, and she might be the foundation teacher in my life. In addition to teaching me basic good thinking and good conduct, she called me into her room during her lunch hour one day and told me to stop playing the fool because I was playing the fool just to get accepted. And she said, it is better to be right and march into hell than to follow a bunch of fools into heaven. I wanted to do something to impress Miss Taylor. We had current events on Friday. We wanted to say something unusual because I worked for white people before and after school and they had magazines. They would receive them one day, read them hurriedly, I'd throw them away the next day. So when I got up for current events, I always had something decidedly different to say about my own people and about other people. No, I wanted to do something real, real big. So I went to a lawyer that uh, I worked for before and after school. I can still remember his name, Gag Steider. And I asked him for a book about my people in early world history. He says, I'm sorry, John, that uh, you came from a people have no history. My mind would not accept that. I continued to search, and I opened a book called The New Negro, and I opened to an essay called The Negro Digs Up His Past. And for the first time, I knew that I came from a very old people, that we were older than slavery, older than oppression, older than Europe. Now the scramble began for more information. During the disaster years of the Great Depression, Americans in huge numbers take to the rails. They don't take Pullman cars or day coaches. They stow away on the freights riding the rails in search of the opportunity to create a better life. John Henry Clark wrote them. Out of the South first, briefly to Chicago, and then on to New York City. I had a dream. I thought that because I'd had some success in writing local plays, writing lyrics for songs for local plays, and that I could go write professionally. It was a dream, it's a fantasy. I was pursuing this fantasy. At 18, you could pursue all kinds of fantasies. In the shadow of Manhattan's towering skyscrapers lies black, sprawling Harlem, greatest Negro metropolis in the world. Now, impressions of the Harlem community, in the first place, it was a clean community. It was an orderly community. It was a safe 
community. It was a community with its customs that we have forgotten now. Street speaking customs, strolling customs, social customs. There was a time when 7th Avenue, now Adam Powell Boulevard, was the street of choice. And you did not walk down 7th Avenue on Saturday or Sunday without a coat and a tie. There was a custom of getting a lady in a long good suit and walking down 7th Avenue to show her off. You would walk 15 blocks. Sometime when you had a dollar or so to spend, you would take on the 5th Avenue open bus all the way down to New York University and all the way back. And she was satisfied, and the whole evening, you hadn't spent a dollar. A lot of times, you didn't have one. They sure don't make ladies like that anymore. There was a time there were three functioning vaudeville theaters in Harlem, all well patronized. The Lafayette, Harlem Opera House, and the Apollo. The old Lincoln Theater, now a church, used to be a legitimate theater where the plays downtown would be brought uptown with the play with the black cast. Tyler, show my pet. And that was our Broadway. I got involved with the communists and the socialists and other radicals and to read literature on the Russia of that day, to see movies about Russia. I was never a member of the Communist or the Socialist Party. I was active briefly in the Young Communist League. We were looking for a way out of the condition in which we lived. And they opened doors for us and gave us a platform we otherwise did not have. Paul Robeson was the one artist who made the great sacrifice based on commitment. And that commitment is that an artist supposed to use his or her art to change the society in which they live. W.E.B. Du Bois is our greatest single intellect we produced in the whole of the Western world, and he's not just a black American intellect. He is an American intellect equal to any. W.E.B. Du Bois, Paul Robeson, the party came closest to what those men wanted to stand for in the world was a fair deal for the working people of the world. We would examine it later to our sorrow. That we were in an argument between not a liberator and an oppressor, but two oppressors with different techniques and methodology of oppression. In the final analysis, Russia did not want us to be free any more than in the United States and England and the imperial powers, but they wanted us under their domination. I never thought the left movement, communist or socialist, made any serious study of the history in the background of the African people of the world. And they had a preconceived notion of us that had nothing to do with our reality. And these African communal societies, who each got according to his needs, were not copied from Europe because they existed before there was a Europe.